Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Recoup. I'm Cooper Daniels, and I'm a guy that knows a little about a lot. And today, I am here with Stefan Heckenberger. He is the co-founder of BlockShake, and BlockShake is responsible for the DeFly wallet on the Algram blockchain, and also co-founder of Nort Labs, which is like an art design kind of open source machine uh, uh, company. It's a really interesting thing that you uh, – well, first off, how are you doing, Stefan? How's it going? I'm great. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. So real quick, just because I think this will be interesting to the Algorand community, in 2006, I think it is, you you created Nort Labs with Addy uh, uh, Wag- Wagenecht. Wagenecht, am I saying that right? Wagenecht, yes. Wagenecht. Yeah, and she is a very popular person in the Algorand community, has contributed a ton. So that's really cool. You Did you guys meet? In in uh, New York, am I getting that right? Yes, we were at ITP in New York, and then we're you together, okay. and we did our our final project together, and then moved to Austria. Uh, oh so gosh. we have quite a history uh, in in open source hardware design. That's where we yeah. met. Yeah, I saw that you guys did a very popular what laser cutter that was open source, right? Yeah. Our first thing was a huge multi-touch screen, which uh, uh-huh. at the time was pretty cutting edge. Now it's totally normal to have yeah. this around. Uh, uh, the next project was a laser cutter, a do-it-yourself laser cutter. Yeah, fully open. Yeah, and, and it awesome. seems like you guys really just sort of gave, you're giving this stuff away, like that laser cutter. Eventually you're like, all right, we're not going to be making the, or providing the kits anymore, but this is where you can buy it and giving people like, how to it's just you kind of just gave it away right i guess that's what open source is but yeah absolutely we were definitely exploring so at the time our open source was fairly established so everybody knew about linux and uh our big question was can this transfer to hardware Mm -hmm. and that was sort of our our focus then and academically it was super interesting and uh also just as a general way of designing something together and designing something that can outlast uh, your own participation. And it's actually uh, a a lot of those elements that uh, come into play when building uh, for crypto, you know, for building all this infrastructure, because a lot of those projects are built completely open source. uh, Right. Model. Absolutely. Okay, so before we kind of dive in more about this, why don't we just go back to how you, uh, you know, a little bit about who you are, how you got to where you are today, blockchain, cryptocurrency, you know, building these types of things, building the DeFi app, like, what is your journey like? And also how you got to Algorand? Right. um, So my background is in computer science and space engineering. And uh, at some point, I switched over to a more sort of media design area. So we were doing a lot of uh, computational algorithmic design, which at the point at that time, nobody really understood. And it was completely unsellable or <laughs> well, I had no application, but it was very interesting to do. So uh, one of my, my biggest interest was uh, creating designs that have sort of an uh, parametric space. Mm-hmm. So we like, have sliders and you can change traits. And interestingly, this is this has become very relevant to the whole like NFT design methodology and all of that. Um, so a lot has happened in that space, and that's where I started out. Sort of where my interest started out, um, moving away from the more technical stuff a little bit more into the design field, and then uh, it m- moved further into interface design. So uh, at ITP NYU we. So together with Eddie, we did this multi-touch system and um, there was before there was any kind of APIs in the operating system. So we had to write all the software, uh, all the APIs for it, all the sort of computer vision that recognizes your fingers on the screen and all of that. And just, so it was was an interesting journey. It's just like testing out new ways, you know, trying out new ways Mm -hmm. uh, and learning a lot. And 
from that we got into um sort of the rapid prototyping uh craze um so when the whole 3d printing started uh we thought okay what else would be interesting and mm -hmm. we decided to build this uh open hardware laser cutter and that project was fairly complex uh it was actually so complex that uh, we didn't have a competitor for the longest time because it was like 3,000 parts that you had to kind of uh, document how to put them together. And uh, it was fairly, you know, high high risk level. So uh, it, it wasn't really something that was easily, I should say, easily commercializable. So it was like, it wasn't easy to uh, commercialize it in a way uh, so it's both open hardware, open source, and uh, a company, a big company could, could be built around it. But as a niche, it worked really well. I think there are about, I would say, 500 to 1,000 of those machines out there. And they, they are designed in a way so they can be maintained without the, a company you know, um, doing the maintenance. So mm -hmm. they, they're like owner-operated, owner basically. And all the parts in those machines are off-the-shelf parts apart from very few parts. So that, that was the challenge with that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, after 10 years, uh, the project, you know, found it's uh, like, we kind of like moved out of the project and uh, left it to their own uh, forums and community. Right. And then just a, a quick question about that. So 3D printing in general, you, you, you hear a lot about it. If you follow maybe Kathy Wood, mm -hmm. she's been very, you know, vocal about how that is the future and how it's going to, uh, what are your thoughts on 3d printing and, and where that's taking us? Um, it's interesting. Um, <laughs> like per, <laughs> yeah, I, I can, um, talk from a personal point of view, um, in that whole journey of like building all those machines and, uh, you know, like the softer side, the harder side and manufacturing things. Uh, I got very good at like manufacturing to the point that I almost don't need them anymore. So um, I can very quickly build things. Um, <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, I actually, I mean, this is very, very personal and has nothing to do with, you know, people trying to solve things and like having rapid prototyping for small numbers. But personally, mm -hmm. I, I use it more as like a, a field where I, I work off screen. So I right. let the, the manual work on on parts. So I don't use I don't unfortunately don't use it anymore because okay, you don't. my skills are <laughs> like, <laughs> good enough that I don't need in most cases I don't need like a laser cutter or a three D printer. Right. So you're so it's not a particularly uh, interesting call. I, the idea that maybe I'll order a table and then go pick it up from the printer store is um, is not something that you're thinking a lot about. <laughs> Uh, I, I wrote software you know, that designs like parametrically furniture and that stuff. And I, I really like seeing that actually like existing now in the, in the mm -hmm. world, where, like, you know, there's an online service where I can like sort of scale a shelf and it's, yeah. you order it and it fits exactly into my room. So all of that is, I think it's pretty cool. That's cool. I mean, you know, I did, I, I, I was aware of who you were. I'm obviously aware of the DFly app, but then as I was looking into it, and I think the audience already knows, I, I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, Stefan, and, and it's not just that you went to SJSU, San Jose State, like I did. I mean, it's more than that, you know, <laughs> so, um, awesome. but it's, uh, it's also, I, I noticed that. And then I think actually we were, you were at NYU with Addy at the same time that I was at the new school. So we were down the street there. So I've been following you. You just didn't know it. But, oh. um, yeah, but anyways, I, just how like impressive, uh, you know, your resume is, I mean, also you're building or I, I know it's like a hobby, but like X Hawk, isn't this like a, a flying car or, you know, you know, what do we, what do you have there? Uh, so, I mean, out of the rapid prototyping came sort of the urge to build something, um, of utility and, uh, <laughs> I got into uh, exper experimental airplanes, uh, for some reason. and. I found that it's actually very similar to there's a long history of people documenting how to build airplanes. And a lot of those experimental airplane plans, they are kind of open source or they like sold for a fairly uh, cheap price and people mm -hmm. can 
source all the like if you're very extreme you source all the parts and like manufacture every parts put an airplane together and then test flight so mm -hmm. i was very fascinated <laughs> um i think i'm just like naturally attracted to things that are you know very uh very <laughs> difficult uh, <laughs> I like, you know, I like this feeling when uh, I don't understand something at all. And at some point it starts making sense. This like, this, uh, yeah. this learning curve, I, I, I think I'm a little bit addicted to it. It's almost that's a good, that's a good thing to be addicted to. I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. It can be too much sometimes. But, uh, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> So, so it's, it's more of an airplane. So you know, maybe what is that project? I mean, it's a popular project. It's a project that's been going on for a while. Right. And I think it's evolved to where, you know, the, the military, you know, the country militaries are, in, you know, interested in it. Like what, what is that project? Maybe, sorry. I, I know you came on here thinking, okay, we're going to talk about D fly. And now I'm asking you about X Hawk. You mean, you mean X Hawks? Uh, X Hawk is just an experimental airplane. So okay. um, it's a fairly conventional airplane. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually I, I chose it because it's a very simple design that um, has pretty good performance, uh, and I like yeah. the way it was built. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's, cool. It's, it's it's special in a way that it's like an airplane you built yourself, but within the uh, experimental airplane world, it's a fairly, uh, you know, safe project, I would say. Right. Okay, cool. So you're building these things in New York. You're, um, you're constantly kind of evolving and challenging yourself with these impossible tasks that, um, you know, unfold for you. How do you eventually get to uh, blockchain and more specifically, you know, Algorand? Um, so Addy got in first, uh, and then I kind of followed because we needed something to talk about at home. <laughs> so it's just one party like talks. Um, so the, the segue was the, the open source software community and sort of this, uh, design methodology and building communities and, uh, groups of uh, developers in open so source, uh, software. So. That's where Eddie and I had a lot of experience because we were doing this for like, you know, 12 years, probably something like that. And a lot of that is applicable to um, uh, sort of the, the crypto field. Uh, the interesting difference is we, you know, back before crypto, we were always struggling with, uh, with a budget, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, for those projects. Um, and that was almost to the extreme where people did, only did it out of the good of their heart and uh, bankrupt themselves. So like, you know, at some point had to leave the project and couldn't uh, maintain it. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the whole uh, uh, blockchain and crypto, uh, open source software development, uh, this completely changed. So to the point that like some projects they have they are idea limited, I would say. They have enough capital to do every idea, every good idea that comes up and to the point that sometimes they run out of ideas and then start airdropping tokens. <laughs> <laughs> it gets so bad that they just have to give it away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's very interesting, uh, very, uh, quite, quite a difference. So that's exciting. And uh, um, there's a lot of questions to it. Uh, another thing we did uh, with the laser saw project is we we used uh, Kickstarter very early. Mm -hmm. So when Kickstarter came out, we were one of the first bigger projects on Kickstarter and tried out this whole growth uh, sourcing model. And mm -hmm. when we started uh, DeFi, we we used a sort of um, a token, a project token, as a, as a form of crowdsourcing. So I think it's very interesting to think of having projects with a, a with a token and the, using the token for crowdfunding, sort of a, in a crowdfunding way for like developing that project further. Right, absolutely. And you guys have handled that token launch impeccably. That doesn't always happen so well, but I mean, it seems to have really gone well. And um, even though you guys adjusted in the middle, we'll talk about that. So mm -hmm. I guess. My next question is, so, okay, so did you guys enter into the space through Algorand or did it come earlier, Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, et cetera? Uh, so I started pretty much with Algorand. Um, mm -hmm. 
I mean, I dabbled with Bitcoin and I had a six butterfly miners early on mm-hmm. and things like that, but that wasn't any, I, I didn't use any substantial amount of time for that. Um, I, I got started with Algorand, uh, Eddie was at, uh, parity sort of in the polka dot ecosystem before that. Mm, cool. Cool. Mm-hmm. All right. So there's DeFly. DeFly is um, a wallet on the Algorand blockchain. It is kind of this epic, like takes like what's best about like a traditional like finance wallet or interface and, and brings it to DeFi. And before we really dive into DeFly, you know, right now in crypto, it's it's crazy, right? I mean, we're we're going through a, a massive shakeup. It's a bear market. You know, FTX just exploded. Um, people are losing tons of money and regulators are swarming right now. They're like, this is an, uh, and clear. It's clear to me that, uh, you know, the problems are these centralized actors so much you know, of the time or, you know, bridges and DeFi, but mm-hmm. uh, usually it's, uh, you know, Celsius, Voyager, FTX. And I think there's this sentiment that um, from like, the SEC and stuff that they need to regulate DeFi and Sam Bankman Freed actually got some heat for uh, the way he thought that uh, DeFi should be regulated just recently. And we all know how this has turned out for him. But um, I, what are your thoughts on, or do you have thoughts on regulation and DeFi and specifically? Yeah, I mean, I definitely thought about it. And I mean, part of the motivation for doing uh, DeFi is so if the question is, uh, can you do uh, all of that in a decentralized way? Uh, mm-hmm. I think if you start from first principles, um, you, you look at nature and look what, what are stable systems, what are sustainable systems, and they usually have a very tight feedback loop uh, and are decentralized. So sort of this tight feedback loop allows you to uh, have self-correcting systems. Mm-hmm. and. I think generally that's true for everything that we built and what I, what I value. There's very often there's a gap, you know, where it's not that practical. And the same thing is with uh, decentralized finance. I think uh, there's a certain gap. So when you when you look at you know FTX it's in the news right now, that whole fiasco, uh, it's like why are people still using FTX and Binance and the like? Um, and not going straight to DeFi. And there, there are good reasons, and there's, there's a little bit of a gap. And looking at the gap and understanding why, you know, we don't use the underlying technology in a way it is designed, because it's the underlying technology is completely designed for a decentralized approach. So why are we not using it that way? So, mm-hmm. so that's sort yeah. of the starting point. For, for, right. For the- so if I'm understanding you, the starting point of DeFi is exactly why do we, uh, okay, so the question is, why do we even need centralized exchanges in right. custody? And then you're thinking, well, one of the main reasons is just accessibility and having a product that people are used to using and, you know, it feels mm-hmm. familiar to somebody that isn't experienced in this space. And that's part of what DeFi is trying to solve? A large part is definitely usability. So just yep. how easy is it to use? So the centralized, I mean, the apps for the centralized exchanges, they have done quite a good job, you know, bringing that usability, bringing that, uh, that hurdle of entry way down. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the DeFi space, uh, you know, it's a little bit more complicated. So, uh, as experts, you know, if you're in the field, it's, it's not that hard, but if you have, to, if you explain it to somebody, you have to like open like three windows and there's a the browser there and there's this service, and then you combine them all. And then you take your wallet and you connect to this service. <laughs> so, yeah. You realize that it's, it's actually not that simple, simple to yeah. use. Uh, yeah, I, I know my wife is always like, why do you have so many windows open? And I was like, because every time I, it's just uh, lots of windows, <laughs> there's always lots of windows open in D5. Well, but yeah. With D5, we, we try to solve it on a, just on a user interface level. Mm-hmm. So that's one thing. Uh, there's other considerations like security. Like one of the big arguments for centralized custodial systems is that you 
take this responsibility and give it somebody else uh, to yes. take care of the funds. And uh, some people argue that you, you, it's just too much for the, the average user to give them so much responsibility, which I mm -hmm. disagree. Uh, but that's a, a strong and recurring argument in the, in the mainstream. So there's solutions to that as well. And we can, we can talk about that too. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I mean, Coinbase started as just a custodian, right? That was, they were just going to hold people's Bitcoin for them, if I, if I remember correctly. Um, well, let, let, okay, well, then let's talk about that. Let's talk about some of these solutions of custody. Um, what, what, are you, what are you thinking along those lines? Like, what will kind of demystify? Because everybody's like, oh, my God. Like, you know, if they have a significant amount, like if, let's say, somebody has a couple mm -hmm. hundred Bitcoin or something, like it's possible that they don't want that responsibility. Um, what are some solutions that you see or that your, you know, block shake is potentially working on or, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. um, I mean, you can approach it on different levels. So, um, on the simplest level is you start, um, a new account and then you get a private key and then you need, need to safe keep the private key. Uh, so the first thing is like, the app usually stores it, but if you lose the app and reinstall it, you have to recover it. So yeah. the next step is that you, you know, write it down and put it in a safe place. And then the question is, okay, what's that safe place? Um, and what if that safe place disappears? So if it's in your house somewhere, your house burns down, you, you also, you lose that. So next step would be to store it in two different places. So there's um, this, this complexity that if you want to do this well, um, you run into this complexity of like safekeeping this private key. Um, and to, to really solve that, you have to have a kind of good strategies where you have, you can set up very, very uh, elaborate ways of doing it with multi-sigs and, and hardware latches and all, all kinds of things to, to guard against different, uh, threat models. Mm -hmm. And ultimately I think that needs to. Uh, there needs to be, you know, a better, a better way of, of, of doing exactly this, where you can say like, oh, if you're like sort of a private user, like do this. If you are a professional user for business, then you do this with, uh, without having to have like, you know, a secure place, like a, like two vaults in two different houses. Right. Uh, and, um, from a technical point of view, uh, like we have been looking quite recently into uh, opaque. So um, we're lucky that we have a contact with uh, sort of the cryptography team at, at the Algorand Foundation. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we are very careful looking now into sort of ways of uh, storing, managing, basically creating a, man uh, a key management system that allows it to sort of distribute sort of those risks. So technically right. it looks like from my point of view, from my first reading is like technically there's like all the solutions out there, um, that just need to be used. It's like, so yeah. um, is that, is that connected with vendable? Are you guys working with vendable or is that, um, a, 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 a different pro a solo project? It, yeah, it's, it's separate. It's separate. Cool. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I, I think I interrupted you with that question. Were you going to say something else? No. Okay. No. Um, okay. So, so let's talk more about DeFi and maybe dive into the roadmap. I mean, we're talking about security, and I and I, I will be honest. One of the my first kind of uh, what what made me a little slower to uh, adopt DeFi for myself was that I had to input my private keys, and so mm -hmm. that was just kind of like ah, uh, and then. Um, but I've, I've come around and I'm like, okay, well, uh, but I, I'd like to hear from you. So what is it about importing your private keys uh, on DeFi that doesn't, isn't a security risk? Um, well, I mean, it's interesting. Uh, we, we wrote a, a blog article about that because we had that critique because typically uh, the users would already have accounts and then they would want to start using uh, DeFi. So the, the, the simple truth is if, uh, that 
when you have an app either in your browser or on your mobile device and you create an account, it stores the private key on the device. Mm-hmm. And uh, to keep it secure, you want to have it only on the device. You don't want this app to send it somewhere or back it up in the Google Cloud or store it somewhere else. You want to have it strictly on the device and on the device, you want to have it within sort of the secure uh, storage mechanism. So uh, iOS and Android, they both have a secure storage mechanism where you can sort of uh, protect certain secrets. Um, so that that that's how it works. Um, yeah. When you um, sort of transfer an account to the second device, you need to get the private key to the other device. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, the alternative you can do is you can just create a new account on the other device in DeFi or in, in another wallet app and transfer your funds and then stop using the old account and then start using the new account. But yeah, you, the way you just said that makes it sound so obvious. You're just like, well, like, yeah, you know. If you want, if you had an account and you wanted to use DeFi as your wallet, then we need the private key so we can execute these swaps for you. Or you could just create a new one with DeFi and write down some new words. Uh, but it's all the same. It's just like a para wallet. It's saving your private key in in your secure area on your phone, your Android or your iPhone. And you know when you execute a swap that you have to see that you i mean i guess the idea was always like since i'm putting these into dfly do i have to trust the dfly team that they ha- like that they're not going to access my my private key i guess that was my somewhat you know uninformed question but well the, the thing with the wallet is uh, fundamentally it's it's a piece of software that or piece of hardware and software like in the hardware ledgers that you have to trust to secure your private keys. Mm-hmm. So uh, there's like the responsibility of the wallet is keep your your private keys secure, mm-hmm. and uh, that's what a, that's what a wallet is fundamentally. And yeah. the idea is that you want the wallet that keeps the private keys on your device in the secure storage. Yeah, as much yeah. as possible. Uh, uh, and as, as soon as you give away the, the, the private key uh, to a central exchange or use accounts on a central exchange where they hold the private key, it's a different model. I mean, you, have yeah. to, you have a custodian that takes care of your funds. Absolutely. And you know, on that point, after having those thoughts, and I'd go around asking people, and then it seemed like pretty much everybody was – the consensus was, well, the DeFly team is like epic. Like I was top notch, you know, that's, that's something that I hear repeatedly. I had Chris Wenner on the show recently and he, he complimented um, you guys and you guys also had an assist for humble swap um, early on, right? There was uh, you, you guys noticed a bit of something going on and you helped out and nothing happened, but is there anything, any details about that, that are particularly um, interesting? Uh, as a short story is, uh, we try to implement, we try to connect DeFi to Humble Swap. So, oh. and as we did that, we found some uh, curious differences to other DEXs, and then realized that there was like a bug in there and reported it to them, and they, yeah. um, you know, fixed it. They reacted yeah. very quickly uh, and fixed it well and relaunched their their smart contract. Absolutely. Yeah. So you were just trying to connect to Humble and you're like, oh, wait a second, this could be an issue. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, all right. So DeFly um, currently right now it is incredible. I mean, I will say this about Algorand and I'm sure you'll agree. I mean, I have dabbled in other ecosystems. Our mobile wallets are top notch. You guys, Para, I mean, these are two, Really, and then Exodus is also um, integrated with Algram, but like uh, Para and um, DeFly are really just beautiful, really nice wallets. I, have you looked around and been like, "Yeah, we're we're doing this right"? <laughs> I mean, I, I think so. Um, yeah, I mean, we we're very focused on just getting our roadmap done, so we have like this very high goals for ourselves, and yeah, 
we also have like a community that constantly, you know, re really pushes us. So we get a lot of feedback through the community. And I think I want to em emphasize this here that we it really keeps us going forward quicker than, you know, we would otherwise without that constant feedback and that celebration by the community. So that really drives us. Um, and I think, you know, once in a while we look up and we do realize, like we do a comparison to one inch wallet, for example, or like Meta, MetaMask, mm -hmm. and realize that we are, you know, a completely different beast. So like we have to, we have the complete market information in there. We have, uh, you know, all those positions, everything you can do in a DeFi market, like it's, it's still tracked. So when you farm, when you like use lending protocols, you still have it all listed in your wallet and you know where your funds are things like that uh we have uh, the algorand foundation which means when you do a swap um it's actually a, a technical detail that's really important so when you do a swap you can do fairly complex swaps back it all into one group and execute it atomically which means mm -hmm. the whole thing either goes through to your specifications or gets rejected as a whole mm -hmm. uh, and we can do this on Algorand, uh, like we can split an order onto multiple DEXs as an atomic swap. So it's, it's, it's actually quite fascinating because the whole thing is, can consist of like 16 transactions and gets executed on multiple DEXs and the whole thing goes either through or not if, if it's successful. Uh, so you have this like, this like whole custody line, like full control over your funds all the way through the swap, which is really yeah. interesting. And on top of that, the whole thing happens in like, you know, under four seconds, which is kind of magic. It's incredible. It's incredible. Yeah. And, and I'll say, I mean, this is important and the, um, maybe just being obvious, but like if you have one of these combo swaps and, you know, the first part of it goes through and then the other, you might not want the only the first part to go through, right? Exactly. Or, yeah. Yeah. Or, and I imagine that, uh, I, and I don't know that this is on your roadmap, but I, I did see that you guys are um, either teaming up with or um, helping um, Alamex. Am, am I right about that? Is that? A um, so um, we're working on a, a protocol together that's okay. called Deflex. And Deflex. basically, yeah. So the, the functionality of um, order routing of Alamex and the combo swaps of of DeFly are wrapped into a protocol. Oh. So um, it's a fully composable protocol we um, have on, on chain. Mm -hmm. And this functionality will basically be available in sort of a permissionless way to uh, all, every platform that wants to use it. Oh. Yeah, because I did notice with Alamex uh, compared to the swaps that you can do on Alamex and then on DeFly, and correct me if I'm wrong, but um, it's like on Alamex, for example, I can swap USDC for Go BTC, right? You know, and it'll swap my USDC for Algo and then it'll swap the Algo for the, and it'll do those types of swaps. And I don't believe you can do that yet on DeFly, right? Yeah, that's right. So, so actually, backstory, uh, we have been working with Alamex on this project for the better part of the last five months, almost now. Okay. So this is, is an interesting story because it's a quite an unlikely partnership because we mm -hmm. you know, are actually natural competitors. But um, mm -hmm. uh, at some point, we just started talking and realized that we like working with each other. <laughs> Uh, well, that's what this is where I'm headed. I'm like, because it's you seem like competitors. Sorry, yeah, right, right. So we, we, I, I think we were both surprised, you know, how much we we can complement each other. Uh, so this this partnership has been really great so far, um, and we cool. we're right in the middle of finalizing the project and and announcing it and putting it out there. That's cool. So will. I mean, what happens to Alamex and then what happens to combo swaps on, uh, on DeFly? Or, or, I mean, won't you guys will just be using DeFlex, right? Right. So we're basically rolling this all into, into this protocol. Uh, mm -hmm. And I can also say the protocol, we also support limit orders 
fully composable yeah. and all like this. So that would be pretty sweet. Yeah. Uh, and it will allow everybody to use it. So um, it has like a, a micro fee model built in. So mm -hmm. it can has like a um, can support itself. So we can, uh, you know, make sure we can audit it multiple times in the future and uh, further develop it. Uh, but in, in principle, it's this like protocol you use like a DEX protocol and it's like fully uh, trustless on chain and permissionless and any D any dApp can can basically use it yeah 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 and then I, the fact that you guys are building these tools because we are in algorand we are getting more dexes and to be able to have these tools is so much easier i mean it's just beautiful like i mean i use dfly for all my swaps now and mm -hmm. um i'm excited for dflex so, okay, you mentioned limit orders, and that's something that is coming soon. Um, is that coming with Dflex? Um, that's when that will come, right? That's and, right. Uh, yeah, and then I think the uh, – and recently you guys integrated NFTs on the Dfly app. Am I correct about that? That's right. Yeah. And um, there's more to come, right? So Ledger, so you're going to be able to uh, – there will be Ledger compatibility soon, multi-sig soon. and then. Um, some of the a, a desktop uh, app is that is that happening soon? Uh, that's uh, on the roadmap for next year. So next year, uh, the this year's roadmap uh, we're gonna have Dflex. So they're gonna be all those features of Dflex, which means uh, Dfly will have limit orders. Um, so you will be able to use Dflex from Dfly naturally. Yeah. Uh, gives you limit orders uh, for all dexes. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, will allow you to do limit orders that then get executed in a liquidity optimized way with a combo swap, for example, or with a multi-hop. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to have that rolling out. Um, we going to have, we already have the NFTs. So the NFT mm -hmm. browser in there and NFT support. We have um, the, the hardware ledger support, which is a big one. So mm -hmm. it's really close to my heart. Because it will allow you to do basically a, you know, a swap from your hardware ledger. So you will have funds on your hardware ledger, and you can like do a swap with a limit order with Dflex with an optimized multi-hop and a combo swap through one atomic swap uh, and get it back onto your hardware ledger. So wow. I think that, that that's sort of you know. The goal we we set ourselves uh, we wanted to reach for this year, and I think this uh, will be the sort of the, the functionality that DeFi needs to really you know have a competitive edge with centralized exchanges. Absolutely, and then there um, I saw you know on the roadmap for next year there's um, DeFi staking and farming uh, on the roadmap for mm -hmm. for the um, the app, and then um, also bridging. So what's the, what's the plan for bridging really? Um, the, the bridging thing, uh, we, we thought about different ways of approaching it. So it's like, a, it's a huge field because there's so many things going on, so many moving targets, so many ways you can approach it. Um, but I think, uh, for DeFi, it makes most sense to, uh, see it as, or use it as an on off ramp for, for eth and uh, and bitcoin like we would start with on off ramping eth and bitcoin directly into dfly mm -hmm. uh, and then you know branching out from that so just to give you a sense how they would look like you would have in dfly you would have sort of a bitcoin position and when you look into the bitcoin position you would see all the rep tokens it consists of and uh one idea is to have it user configurable. So you can say, my Bitcoin, I want to hold in Go PTC or PPTC or whatever. You know, you want to build up that Bitcoin position out of different reps tokens. And then you can swap it as, as this V asset where like it then splits up the swaps into those different holdings. Uh, and then you can um, off ramp it to a, a native Bitcoin address or on ramp from a native Bitcoin address into this V asset in DeFi. So th that's kind of how we think about. Uh, so, 
So what you're saying is, is that on the DeFi app, I'll have a Bitcoin position and that could be GoBTC or uh, PBTC or, uh, you know, whatever, uh, uh, what's wormholes? Is that just, but whatever, whatever wrapped Bitcoin it is, it's all there. And then if I'm deciding, okay, I'm ready. I've, you know, I've messed around on Algorand DeFi long enough with my BTC. I'm ready to take it to the ledger and um, store it then you can do this type of, you can just kind of swap it in the most optimal way or to consolidate it, or you're just... Uh, well, it would, uh, would you off -ramp, you would off ramp it. It would go through a bridge into, an, into sort of a native Bitcoin address, yeah. which could be your ledger. Um, yeah. And uh, I mean, the way we see it is uh, it's about risk management because uh, as an investor, you have to look at the different bridges and assess what's the associated risk with it. So when we think of this like V asset, that's a bit composition, uh, it should be, you know, you as a user should be able to choose what rep tokens you prefer because mm -hmm. you have like your, your research into assessing the risk of each rep token. Got so it. it's Got about it. this risk management of like the different quality bridges. Oh, that's cool. Okay. And um, and then obviously, uh, I, I know a lot of DeFi token holders are excited about governance, and I know that that's kind of far along on your roadmap. But um, what is the the vision for uh, DeFi governance? Uh, so we have two kinds of governance. We have uh, the algorithm government governance feature built into DeFi, which is already mm -hmm. in there. Yeah. Uh, so you can do the the governance for your algos directly from mm -hmm. from it and it what's nice about it 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 reminds you which positions are actually staked in governance so you don't actually accidentally uh undercut those and become ineligible for them um the other thing i think what you're asking is the governments for defi itself so mm -hmm. uh, that that's something we have also on the roadmap for next year and um Generally speaking, you know, uh, I mentioned that we see it a little bit as like a, a way of crowdfunding the project. You know, the token mm -hmm. is like a way of crowdfunding the project. Um, a lot of, like fundamentally, the way I see it is, uh, you know, certain people come together and build something and then, you know, want to like share ownership with a group of users. So this idea of user-owned projects uh I think is is really cool. Uh, a lot of the the friction or the difficulty with doing that exactly like you want is regulation, because mm -hmm. you run into security regulations that are in a lot of countries. Which is, I think, in the long term, in the long term, I think there will be a solution for that because it's just makes so much sense that like when people come together and have like a community and then you wanna you know sort of use or own a project, why mm -hmm. should why should there be any like obstacles in a way? It makes so much sense to me that this should be possible. Uh, so, but now we're, we're still like, you know, dealing with, you know, with the regulation we have. So a, a lot of uh, those plans um, have to navigate that space of regulation. So, but in, right. in principle, uh, governance means that we can, you know, vote on sort of decisions for a project. Got it. That's possible. Oh, um and well, and one thing that DeFly has certainly done um, wonderfully is create a very passionate community that you were talking about earlier that is consistently giving you feedback is, you know, constantly shouting out the DeFly app and rightfully so. And um, I guess I, I do have a question about DeFlex once because one of the utility uh, of the DeFly token is that if you, you hold a certain amount, then... Um, and you get less, you know, you pay less fees and you get more of the benefit from the combo swap. And so once DeFlex is live and anybody can kind of adopt it, um, will that utility of the DeFly token still exist? Uh, yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but there's obviously something that needs to move into the protocol. And uh, we're exploring that right now, how exactly that will, will translate. Uh, the way the protocol is done is uh, a lot of those fees are configurable. So whoever uses the protocol can configure the fees. Uh, 
and also like participate in the micro fees. So the default oh. is so the the micro fees for using the protocol is set super low, mm -hmm. uh, but the the platforms that use the protocol can opt to set them at different levels. So um, this is leaves it open how you ex, ex, you know. Oh, I mean, sort of, uh, um, a reward model into it or a utility model. Got it. Got and it. So it's not. Yeah. So it's flexible. So if you right. know my, I, I decide to adopt it and create something. I can cre I can create it and pump up the fees a little bit in order to actually make some money. Right. And right. DFly can give a discount to the fees by users holding DFly. Gotcha. That makes right, right. a lot of sense. And then something that I didn't mention that was on the roadmap is also burning and minting LP tokens, right? Just directly right. from the... Uh, so that's something that's coming soon too, right? Yeah, we have, we have been pushing this a little bit uh, back because there's important stuff that always came up. Um, mm -hmm. The NFT stuff we pulled a little bit forward because of the World Cup. We wanted to have this ready for that. So yeah, uh, the, yeah the LP, LP tokens definitely. So... Um, it works pretty well, you know, like doing it with the Wallet Connect, connecting to your dApps. So it's it's solved in a way. Uh, so the utility makes it more convenient to use and simpler, which we definitely want to do. Um, mm -hmm. What I say about these features, we definitely have LP tokens tracking. So whenever you put uh, liquidity into pools, uh, you will see the positions in in the app, which is which is pretty useful. Yeah, it uh, is. You never lose track of where you're putting your liquidity. So that's yeah. that's generally uh, a, a feature that's very subtle in, in, in DeFi. But the more you use it and the more advanced DeFi uh, features you use, the more uh, you see uh, that everything is still listed in, in, the, in the wallet. Yeah. You know, you, you mentioned the World Cup, and that kind of just got me back to just Algorand in general. And you know, something that I thought a while ago and got me to start thinking and talking about Algorand is that I thought there was going to be big events and it was going to get bad and the best tech would survive. You know, this has been why I came to Algorand, you know, from the beginning. And now we're here and the big events are happening and, you know, the Solanas are struggling, the things that I th kind of thought might, you know, who mm. knows? I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball, but... I guess my question for you is, you know, here you are, you're building on Algorand. What is it about Algorand now? And um, what is your hope? Like, what, you know, what are, why are you continuing to build on Algorand? And I mean, I guess you already have. So, <laughs> but mm -hmm. I, I mean, you know, just like, what is your thoughts on why Algorand and, you know, is, yeah. do you see a path towards, you know, them, Algram being a much a bigger player in this um, in the industry. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So um, my whole team. So we started uh, the company Blockshake that builds Algorand. We we started it about a year ago, mm -hmm. uh, and we all sort of committed like our time and energy into this ecosystem. So we are we're very much invested in it, and the reason is that we believe it has. A very good chance of 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 success because of its technical foundation. Um, I have a list on my Twitter uh, that basically goes through all the competing blockchains and lists why you would want to change to Algorand. What what is the best reason to change to change over switch over from a specific other blockchain to Algorand? And uh, if you look at the competing blockchains, they are there's only a, a very few that can really compete with it. So I think the best competitor is Avalanche to, to Algorand. Mm -hmm. It's probably just the strongest competitor. Like uh, there's a lot of others like Cardano has extremely slow um, uh, block finality, for example. It's like, I think 10 minutes or something, something like yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, Solana, we all know, crashed like many times and now uh, has other problems. So. <laughs> can go through the list and the uh, like Algorand stacks up really well to, to yeah. all of us. And with the whole DeFi, um, 
I was recently at a Bitcoin conference and I really like the idea of Bitcoin. It's, uh, it's not the issue, but it's a lot of holding Bitcoin and not much else. So it's That's like right. from the point from, you know, being somebody that likes sort of the technical part of it and all the, the things that combine and you can build, uh, I'm, I'm very excited about Algorand. Uh, and as we use it, actually, we, uh, it sort of, uh, underlines this quality even more. Like when we started doing the protocols, for example, this deflex protocol is composable onto the DEXs. So it, it doesn't have to do its own liquidity. It uses the DEXs as liquidity. And if you want to do a lending protocol that does an instant loan or instant conversion from one token to another, it can use deflex in a composable way to do that. And then, you know, put position into a, a lending or a lending position. Uh, and you can, not only can you combine it, but you can like combine it all in a, into an atomic transaction and then send it to the blockchain and execute it as like yeah. one thing. Uh, so, uh, so we, from a technical point of view, we really, really see, you know, a lot of interesting things happening, especially this composability where you can build the simple building blocks and co combine them in all this, um, you know, wonderful ways. So, yeah. So you mentioned, um, well, and, and then, for, uh, well, maybe I'll ask. So is there anything, is there a limitation uh, on Algorand that you would like to see changed? Is there something that uh, you see as like, oh, if this could, if this could be fixed, like mm -hmm. this would open up a ton of like opportunity. Um, I, I think the, the main challenge is liquidity. So when we're talking about all the, the bridges uh, and bringing, so I thought about, you know, how does Algorand fit into, you know, the bridge thing. And you could, I think there's a, a strong argument you can make that Algorand could be a uh, scaling solutions for a lot of other blockchains. Mm -hmm. So instead of having like Polygon and Ethereum use Algorand on, you know, bridge to Ethereum mm -hmm. uh, and things like that. So I think I can definitely see that happening. Uh, one key thing is like liquidity. So like all the, you know, bridging transactions, uh, they have very low slippage, you know, very uh, low price impacts. So that's one thing. The, the other thing, uh, there's very few things on a technical uh, level that we, you know, I would, there's, there's a little bit on the transport layer, you know, how uh, uh, relay nodes are decentralized. There's some mm -hmm. improvements we can do, definitely. Yeah. Uh, um, but that's, seems very uh, e like fairly easy to address. So I don't mm -hmm. see this as uh, like a, a showstopper of any sort. Uh, it's just like sort of part of growing. Um, yeah. It's a little bit on sort of executing more complex things on, on chain. So we, we have like another project on the back burner, which is sort of a decentralized uh, voting system where you can anonymously vote on the blockchain and disclose just the right information onto it. So it's verifiable by anybody. And mm -hmm. uh, we ran into some problems with like verifying certain knowledge proofs in a smart contract. So there's some technical limitations for doing fairly complex stuff. Uh, I think this will also be solved eventually. Yeah, you would think, with, especially with zero knowledge proofs and you know uh, the people that created zero knowledge proofs being you know, um, <laughs> the people, Silvio. And so the the voting thing and i'm just gonna I, I know we're running we're winding down and now i'm gonna start talking to you about voting so i i'm we don't need to go on too much but this what's the solution to double voting um on the blockchain um so we we didn't address that in in sort of our research uh we were assuming that somebody else addresses this and then we focused on like how can you vote anonymously on the blockchain okay Okay, so that it'll be one of those things where it is like a zero, where there's probably somebody else does some sort of KYC, you get right. a anonymous uh, digital identity, and then you guys will facilitate. So there will have to be, there's always yeah. going to have to be some kind of registration, because there's no way that you can kind of avoid people opening up several wallets. If you start talking about how do you avoid double voting, it's like, you, you know, you run straight into a super deep question, what is identity? And 
it's it sounds simple but it's it's deeper than in most people like realize it's it's a very deep question because uh, uh we have multiple identities and uh in a sense that we can have like different avatars as different accounts uh, which we present to different uh in different systems and uh we usually translate between identities by just like transferring our whole name and everything across and somebody verifying but uh technically that's not necessary it's technically uh it's possible to only transfer what you need sort of this famous mm -hmm. example if you want to buy a beer, why should you transfer the, you know, your home address to that person? If he only needs to know how old you are. Right. So yeah. you only, and it's technically, you know, there's a technical solution. You can, you know, zero knowledge proof how old you are without disclosing, a, you know, all the other information about yourself. So that's going to get really interesting, I think. And I yeah. think it's got something like that, that identity will be defined by the history of your actions <laughs> kind of thing. You might have like different histories in different systems. So it'll be your identity on the blockchain will be a history of your actions, not necessarily your name and address and social security number or whatever. But so if if somebody on the, a like a folks finance or whatever, not folks finance, just say some lending protocol, and I have this identity that has this long history of good behavior on DeFi that is proven. Mm -hmm they may be more willing to give me some credit score that they've created and be willing to give me like a under collateralized loan or something like that because, because yeah. of my track record. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. Um, all right. Well, okay. Well then before we, before we sign off, I, I will ask you this. So you said it block shake started a year ago. Cool name, by the way, block shakes, a cool name. You guys, <laughs> congratulations on that. That's a cool name. And, but so there's deep live you, you've been working on a voting, um, a voting system. Is there, what else is uh block shake kind of gotten the works or that maybe you can get people excited. So I think I talked about pretty much everything. So it's this new, new protocol. It's deflex. Uh, it's mm -hmm. the voting system, which we, doing a proof of concept. So it won't be a complete product. Um, are we doing a little bit on the foundation side? So we worked on the Algorand voting. So the foundation wanted to do on-chain voting. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we worked on, we actually wrote smart contracts for that, uh, for the voting part. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it didn't quite materialize because there was so many moving targets uh, with the whole DeFi stuff and wanting to have in, uh, no, LP tokens in it, so they delayed it a little bit. But we do work uh, on that with with the foundation, and um, I think I briefly mentioned sort of bringing this opaque protocol uh, to wallets. So, right. So we do, oh yeah. Always, what is what? Is, what does I that mean? Not much about that, but that's uh, that's okay. a pretty interesting approach. Uh, solving, you know, sort of the key management of accounts. The key. Got it. Mm. So when you say the word opaque, I meant to ask you this earlier. I mean, I, I understand, I know the word, but what is, does that mean something other than just kind of like not quite, uh, you know, defined? <laughs> um, it's, it, it's basically solves the issue of, uh, storing sending keys to a server. So if you imagine the, the standard way of doing, uh, authentication on a website is, that you send uh, your key, your, your password mm -hmm. to the server, and then mm -hmm. it gets in clear text, the server verify it, you know, verifies it or like converts it to a hash and compares the hashes. So mm -hmm. a lot of trust you have to put into the server. And uh, there's a protocol that was developed by, by one of the cryptographers of Algorand actually, mm -hmm. um, uh, or like co-developed co uh, that solves exactly this, this problem. And, and it's called opaque and it's called opaque and it's fairly standardized. Uh, it's fairly established, uh, has been around for a while, but is has not quite been used in to solve this, this, this issue. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to come on. Is there anything that I left out? Anything that, uh, you might want to share? I mean, everybody should follow Stefan on Twitter, right? At, is it at Stefanix, right? Yeah, it's the phonics and uh, it's 
eFly app for DeFly. And uh, we will be talking more about DeFlex at uh, block, uh, block Correction Blockchain Forum Italy, BFI Blockchain Forum Italy in Milan. So whoever is there, we'll be talking more about DeFlex there. That's cool. And you'll also, or will you be at uh, Decipher? Um, Phil and Kevin from our team. Will be. Will be. All right. Okay, cool. All right, Stefan, oh, no. thank you so much. Oh, no. Otto and Kevin. Otto and Phil. <laughs> so and I got it right. It was last minute. Is- so we we, did, we didn't decide for the longest time, and then we're like, no, we want to be there, and we tried to okay. like get somebody there. Yeah. We and, um, with- and you and two of you and two were like, fine, we'll go. Uh, yeah. How how big is your team? Uh, so core team is four people. Uh, extended team is like eight right now, something like that. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on. Um, I learned a lot, and um, yeah. Thanks, man. And anytime you want to come back, you're invited. Sounds good. My pleasure. All right. All right. Good meeting you, guys.